Good evening and welcome to our program. This series is focusing on This Is Your FBI. This Is Your FBI was a radio crime drama which aired in the United States on ABC from April 6, 1945 to January 30th, 1953 for a total of 409 shows. The show featured true cases from the FBI and was told from an FBI agent's viewpoint. FBI Chief J. Edgar Hoover gave it his endorsement, calling it our show and calling it the finest dramatic program on the air. Generally, I do not include advisories. Given Hoover's polarizing nature, I will share this. Dramatized stories created for propaganda purposes are not history. They tell one biased side of the story, and in no way am I saying that these are reliable stories. I just believe them to be interesting when viewed through the scope of entertainment and weird history. Finally, I'd like to send a specific thank you to publicdomainreview.org and archive.org for organizing and compiling all of this media. If you would like to listen to standalone media, we have included a link in the description. The Equitable Life Assurance Society presents This Is Your FBI. <laughs> This is your FBI, an official broadcast from the files of the Federal Bureau of Investigation, presented as a public service by the Equitable Life Assurance Society of the United States and the Equitable Society's representative in your community. Are you one of the 50 million Americans covered by Social Security? If so, have you any clear idea of your rights and benefits under Social Security? Well, there may be a pleasant surprise in store for you. For in a few minutes, you will learn from our sponsor, the Equitable Life Assurance Society of the United States, how easy it is to build Social Security into full security. <laughs> Tonight's FBI file, Lady of Larceny. The criminal of necessity lives by his wits. But inevitably there comes the time when they no longer can protect him. For well, the criminal's habits and methods are, almost without exception, as unchanging as the spots of a leopard. And though he be cunning and ingenious enough to escape justice today, he leaves behind him, as in tonight's case from the files of your FBI, the blueprint for his certain defeat tomorrow. <laughs> There was nothing out of the ordinary about the scene that took place that morning in the visitor's room of a county jail in a certain state along the Atlantic seaboard. That is, nothing that appeared out of the ordinary to the stony-faced guard seated at one end of the long table where he could watch both sides of the low wooden partition. Just a mother and her prisoner's son conversing across the partition, talking mother and son talk. After a while, the son glances up at the clock on the wall, then... Well, Mom, I guess that time's about up. Oh, goodness. It seems like I'd only been here a minute. They don't give us very much time, you know. Anyway, it was swell of you to come to see me. I'll come as often as they let me, Frederick. I know you will. And when I'm not here, you just know that you're in my heart every minute, son. Yeah, Sure. Oh, dear, I almost forgot something. What? Well, I was only able to bring you two packages of cigarettes this oh, time. Oh, but... gee, you swell. Oh, here. Uh, here they Wait are. Wait a minute. Hey, guard. Yeah? Mom's brought me some cigarettes. All right for me to take them? Well... Well, why wouldn't it be all right? I have to watch everything we get, Mom. Well, Lance, what could be wrong with a little package of cigarettes? Okay for me to take them, guard? Yeah, go ahead. Thanks. Well, wait now. I brought you some matches, too. Oh. Uh, here they are. Okay. Uh, you be careful with them now, son. What? Well, you know you were always careless with matches. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> okay. 
Okay, Mom. I won't set anything on fire with him. <laughs> All right. Time's up. Okay. Well, so long, Mom. Give me a little kiss over the fence, huh? Of course. Goodbye, son. And I'll see you soon. Real soon, I hope. <laughs> Righty. Oh. I'm sorry, kid. I didn't know you were sleeping. That's okay. Did you know let me show? Yeah. I just left her. Want a cigarette? Okay. Here you are. Thanks. What was new with her? That's what I'm going to find out right now. What do you mean? This book of matches here. Yeah. That's our communication system. Huh? See this little staple that clamps the matches and the book together? Yeah. This one was put in by Mom. Oh, I don't get it. Wait till I yank it out, I'll show you. There. And I'll pull this scratch flap back. Yeah. Separate the two layers of matches. Uh-huh. And down at the bottom here, there should be a message. Well, I'll be sh quiet, stupid. What does it say? Everything's set for tonight. No kidding. Yeah. What's the deal? We make the break at 10 o'clock. Mom will be waiting for us outside in a red Packard ambulance. Ambulance? Yeah. That's real smart. Nobody will stop us in a wagon like that. Well, who's making the break? There'll be eight of us all together. Do the other guys stay with us? No, we split up four and four. Hey, I wonder where your old lady got an ambulance. Listen, kid, if we needed it, that old gal could heist a ferry boat. Mom? Uh, yes? Uh, Anything tailing us? Uh, no, not a soul. We got the road all to ourselves. Well... I have an idea the police are following the young men in the other car. I hope so. Uh, what's your friend's name? Uh, one that was wounded. Whitey. Goodness, I, I hope he's not too badly hurt. I got an idea that he is. Oh, that's a pity. Uh, do you think that I should go in back and see if there's anything I can do for no, him? No, no, you stay oh. here. The other guys will take care of him, okay? Are they all coming with us to the hideout? No, just Whitey. The other two get out after we cross the state line. Oh. Mom, I want you to know that we certainly appreciate what you've done for us. Oh, with nothing. Are you kidding? Getting this ambulance, these white jackets and caps? Frederick, it was just what any other mother would do, so forget it. <laughs> Two hours after the prison break, deputies overtook and captured the four men who had gotten away in the other car. But Fred Taylor, the wounded Whitey Monroe, and their companions were still at large. Convinced that they had crossed the state line after killing a guard, prison officials telephoned the local field office of the FBI. A few minutes later, Special Agents Norman and Perry were searching the cell which had been occupied by Taylor and Monroe for some possible lead. Well, Perry, they seem to have taken whatever effects they had with them. Maybe we'll get a lead out of the stolen ambulance when it turns up. Yes. Did you check on their visitors? Yes. Monroe had no visitors at all, and Taylor, none except his mother. I see. Well, from the guard's description, you couldn't suspect her of anything. No. Come on. We'll study the files on both of them and see it. Now, wait a minute. What? On the floor under the cot here. Well, what is it? An empty matchbook. Oh, Hmm. Bottom staple has been pulled loose and the whole match section is gone. You got a book of matches there? Uh, yes, right here. Pull the staple loose, will you? Okay. There you are. And now spread the two layers apart. Right. If you wanted to smuggle a message to somebody, that'd be a good place to write it, wouldn't it? Yeah, sure. Now look at their empty matchbook. It's 
staple is still partly in place, but look at this. Yes, yeah, a couple of other little holes. Right. Looks like the original staple was taken out, something written or inserted inside, and then the book was restapled. Well, what do you know? Under the microscope in the lab, we'll be able to find the tool markings on the staple of the machine that stamped it in place. What'll that tell us, though? Maybe nothing we want to know right now, but maybe an awful lot later on. <laughs> Take a shot of this, Whitey. Okay, Fred. How do you feel, kid? Not so hot. Well, we got the slug out of you anyway. So by morning, you ought to be feeling better. I, I hope so. I wish we could get you a doc. But we can't risk bringing him out here to the tourist camp. I'll make it okay. Try to cork off now, kid. I'm going to the other room for a little business meeting with Mom. Okay. Hi, Mom. Hello, son. Well, see, so you got the little office all set up. <laughs> Portable typewriter, staple machine. Well, I didn't see any use in wasting time. Where's the portable printing press? We won't need one this time. We got to print up some checks on some company to draw money on, don't we? I already have a book of checks, son. <laughs> Look, uh, how do you like these? The Florida company. The big oil company, you mean? Uh-huh. Where'd you get these? Now, son, you mustn't pry into Mother's little secrets. <laughs> I also have a copy of the President's signature, T.V. Jackson. Terrific. <laughs> and for the small checks, here's a copy of the cashier's signature. <laughs> Mommy, you didn't miss a thing. I run my <laughs> office just as efficiently as they do theirs, son. <laughs> okay, sweetheart. Look, stick a voucher in the typewriter, will you? Huh? We've got to buy us a second-hand car the first thing in the morning. Uh, how much will you need? Oh... Better make it for $1,500 at least. Uh, then we'll staple a memo to the check explaining that the money represents a bonus. How's that? Swell. Uh, yeah, and instead of making it for $1,500 even, I'll, uh, well, I'll make it $1,472.83. That'll sound more legitimate. <laughs> That's my mom. Oh, oh, one thing, son. Yeah. I want you to be careful when you go to buy that used car. There are a lot of crooks in business these days. There's the police garage, Norman. Yes, I guess we can pull right in. Enough room on your side? Plenty. Good morning, officer. Good morning. We're special agents, Norman and Perry, FBI. Oh, yeah. How do you do? Glad to meet you. Hello. Glad to meet you. Hey, you fellas made a mighty quick trip down here to Charleston. Well, can't afford to lose much time. Well, the ambulance we picked up is right over here. Fine. We didn't touch a thing inside, just hauled her from where she was found. Where was that? Just outside of town. Yeah, I better answer that. I'll be back in a minute. Right. Want to take a look inside, Perry? Okay. Find anything? Looks like they played the part all the way. How's that? There's two white jackets. The caps. Hmm. I'll take the caps. You search the jackets. Right. These were probably already in the ambulance when it was stolen. Yes. These caps don't seem to yield up much, no? Oh, oh wait a minute. Yeah. What did you find? Two or three strands of dark hair from whoever was wearing this cap. We'll turn them over to the lab and add them to our other little keepsakes, the match cover and staple. Mr. Norman? Yeah? Your office is calling you long distance. Thanks. Come on, Perry. I wonder what's up. Maybe something on the prison break. Uh, here you are. Thank you. Norman speaking. What? Yes? Yes, where? W what's the name of the camp? Well, never mind. We'll, we'll find it. Right? What's up? Two of the men who got away in the ambulance have been picked up. Good. They said Taylor and Monroe dropped them and then headed for a tourist camp just south of Charleston on Highway 26. I'll bet I know the one they mean, Mr. Norman. Fine. Guess who was with them, Perry? Who? Their outside help, the one who stole the ambulance. Taylor's mother. What? Give us the name of that camp, officer. We'll get going. This is Taylor. Uh, yes, young man? Where's Fred? 
Fe oh, he went into town. What for? To buy an automobile. Taking chances, eh? With the police? Yeah. Oh, I'm sure they don't suspect that we're within a hundred miles of here. What's with the car? Are we moving on? Well, yeah. Oh, uh, just a minute. Who is it? It's me, ma'am. Oh. Well, come on in, son. Thanks. Did you, did you find the car? Yeah, I got us a real good one. Splendid. Fred. Yeah, Whitey. Are we pulling out of here? Yeah. Mom, you better go in and pack. Yeah, but don't you think I that... want to talk to Whitey alone. Oh. Oh. Uh, very well. Whitey? Yeah. I hate to tell you this, but here's where we part company. What do you mean? Mom and I are pulling out. Alone. Look, I can make it okay. Oh, you're in bad shape. You'd slow us down and get us all caught. But I can't stay here with nobody to look after me. Yeah, I know. Well, then I gotta go with you. I'm sorry, kid. You're not going anywhere. Huh? I really hate to do this, Whitey. Now, wait a minute. I gotta look out for Mom. Fred, no, don't. <laughs> Coming, Mother. Turn in just a moment to tonight's case, which shows how your FBI helps provide national security. Now, let's eavesdrop on a conversation about social security between a man named George Leland and his friend, the Equitable Society representative. I don't get it. Why would my brother and his wife need $12,000 more than my wife and I to retire at 65 on an income of $200 a month? Because your brother is a dentist. Oh. What's that got to do with it, Milton? Well, George, dentists aren't usually covered by Social Security. You are. Oh, you don't mean to tell me that Social Security will be worth anything like $12,000 to me. That's exactly what I do mean. When you and your wife get to be 65, you'll be entitled to an annuity from Social Security that at present rate would cost $12,000 in cash. Hey, that's real money. I never realized that Social Security would be worth that much to me. Yes, George, many Americans don't realize what a wonderful asset they have in Social Security. They have never discovered how easy it is to build Social Security into full security through life insurance. Most people are amazed when they discover how little it costs. For instance, if you already own some life insurance, your Equitable Society man may be able to show you how only a few dollars extra per month will give your wife complete protection and assure you a comfortable retirement income through the Equitable Extended Income Plan. Remember, your Social Security benefits vary according to your age, salary, and family situation. So why not get the facts? Find out exactly what you are entitled to under Social Security. The government has prepared a special card that will help you secure this information. To obtain one of these cards, Get in touch with your Equitable Society representative or send your name and address on a postcard to the Equitable Society care of this station. That's E-Q-U-I-T-A-B-L-E, -E, the Equitable Life Assurance Society of the United States. And now, back to the FBI file, Lady of Larceny. Much has been written about honor and loyalty among thieves. But none of it is borne out by the facts. Criminals are without a sense of honor, else they would not be criminals. And the only sense of loyalty they possess is that of loyalty to self-interest. When the chips are down, they think only of themselves. And whoever stands in their way is removed by brutal force. Thank you. 
It was not more than 30 minutes after Fred Taylor cruelly bludgeoned the wounded Whitey Monroe and drove away with his mother that FBI agents Norman and Perry pulled into the tourist camp and were directed by the owner to the right cabin. Try the door, Perry. Well, it's unlocked. Let's go in. Well, looks like they ducked out. Yes. Must have gotten a hold of some new transportation. Stole another car, probably. Maybe they had one of their own waiting around here for them. Wait a minute. What? One of them has been left behind. What do you mean? Look in there, hanging off the side of the bed. Uh, yeah. Come on. He's the one that was wounded. Look. Uh-huh. Whitey Monroe. Oh. The blows on the head are what he got for being in the way, I guess. Nice couple, Taylor and his mother. Yeah. Well, look around and see what you can find, Perry. I'm going to have a talk with the owner of the camp and then put in a long-distance call to our office. Uh, Frederick? Yeah, Mom? Uh, wouldn't you like me to drive for a while? No, no, I feel fine. Uh, you know, I've just been thinking about that unfortunate young man. Whitey? Yes. Yeah. What about him? Well, I had quite a talk with him when you went in to buy this car. Yeah? He was looking forward so to taking this trip with us. He'd never been to Florida. Look, Mom, are you trying to make me feel like a heel? Oh, of course not, son. Oh, you did the right thing. I, Well, I just feel sorry for anyone missing scenery like this. Ow, ow. What's the matter? Oh, I just dabbed myself with this crochet needle. What is that thing you're making? Uh, a doily. What's it good for? To put under a plate. But we ain't got a plate. Well, we're going to have. In fact, we're going to have a lot of plates and a home to go with them. Homes cost money, Mom. Yeah, I know. We're never going to make any big bundle cashing these nickel and dime checks. Yeah, I realize that, too. That's why we are headed for Palm Beach. What do you mean? We're going to make one big score and go under for a while. How? Guess who's vacationing at her Palm Beach home? Who? The wife of the president of the Florida Company, Mrs. P.B. Jackson. So what? Well, we're using Florida Company checks, aren't we? Yeah. Well, Mrs. P.B. Jackson, uh, who won't know about it, of course, is going to help us cash one of her husband's company checks for $10,000. <laughs> Perry, let's review our facts, eh? All right, Norman. We know Taylor and his mother are a check-forging team. That's what he was in for when he broke jail. Yes. We also know that they've skipped. We have no idea in which direction. However, they're bound to start passing checks again, and when they do, we should be able to pick up the trail. You sound pretty optimistic. Well, don't forget, in addition to their descriptions, we pretty well know their methods. They always staple a phony auditing memo to each check, and they also... Wait a minute, I'll get it. Norman speaking. Yes. Yes, what was this? I see. Well, when? Uh-huh. Uh, give me the dealer's name, will you? Right. We'll get busy right away. What's up? The first staple check has shown up. Where? The man posed as a sales agent of the Florida company with a big bonus check. He passed it right here in Charleston three days ago for a used car. Well. The check was drawn on the Florida company's bank, which received it yesterday and refused payments. Does the car dealer know about it yet? No, but I have his name. You'd better hop over and see him. Okay. Uh, get a description of the man who passed the check. Right. Also find out the license and the make of the car. Can I come in, Norman? Come ahead. How'd you make out? I talked with the used car dealer. Mm -hmm. From his description, I'd say it was Taylor, all right, who passed that check. I've already confirmed that. How? The check was sent over here to the office. We examined the staple. The tool markings are the same as the ones we found on that book of matches. I see. Did the car dealer have any idea where Taylor was going? No, but I think I've got a lead on that anyway. Now, what is it? Well, the dealer saw Taylor drive the car across the street to a gas station. Yeah. So I went over there and questioned the manager. Uh-huh, yeah. He remembered Taylor, said that he got some road maps from him, then asked directions for the best way to get to Palm Beach. Uh-huh. 
that doesn't mean he's headed for there, of course. No, but it's the only definite information we have. What's our next move? Let's contact our resident agents in Palm Beach. Give him a description of Taylor in the car, also his pattern of operation. And maybe we ought to hop down there ourselves. <laughs> Mom. Shh, quiet, son. I'm on the telephone. Oh. Uh, now, what was that you were saying, young man? Oh. Oh, yes. Well, that's awfully kind of you. I'll send the chauffeur over to the bank right away. Thank you. What was that all about? I was talking to the bank, pretending that I was Mrs. C.B. Jackson. Oh. I said that I was going to South America and that Mr. Jackson was joining me there later. Uh -huh. Naturally, I needed some money for the trip. And I'm the chauffeur, huh? Exactly. So you take this Florida company check for $10,000 over to the bank, and they'll give you the money. Wait a minute. I just <laughs> thought of something. Huh? That guy's liable to call Mrs. Jackson at her house and just to check back. I know. That's why I'm going to call Mrs. Jackson's home right now and keep the line tied up until you get it. Oh. <laughs> Hurry on, son. Hurry. Okay, Mom. We're in. Well, good work, son. He had all that beautiful green stuff ready when I walked into the bank. <laughs> Splendid. Now we can ditch our hot car, buy us a nice cool one, and then lamb out for a good place oh, to go under. I'll certainly be happy to do that. All right. Huh? Don't make a move. What? Either one. Who are you? We're special agents of the FBI. No, no, no. Wait a minute. Oh. Perry. Right. You might be interested to know that the reason you got that money so easy, Taylor, was because our resident agent had already warned the bank. Huh? We could have picked you up there, but we wanted you to take us to your partner, too. Well, son, it looks like our firm has been liquidated again. <laughs> Although forgery of the Florida company's checks was a federal crime, Fred Taylor was turned over to the state in which he had cold-bloodedly murdered his former cellmate. Tried and convicted there, Taylor was later electrocuted. His mother is serving a term in a federal penitentiary for a conspiracy to violate the National Stolen Property Act. Yes, the criminal's habits and methods are almost without exception as unchanging as the spots of a leopard. And though he be cunning and ingenious enough to escape justice today, he leaves behind him the blueprint for his certain defeat tomorrow. In just a moment, we'll tell you about next week's colorful story from the files of your FBI. And now, once again, friends, let me remind you that no matter how much you earn, you have a valuable asset in Social Security, and your Equitable Society representative will gladly show you how easy it is to build your Social Security into full security. He will explain to you how Social Security and life insurance can work together for your complete protection and will help you determine exactly where you stand under Social Security. No obligation, of course. Phone him tomorrow. Your Equitable Society representative is listed in your local phone book under the name Equitable, E-Q-U-I-T-A-B-L-E, -E, the Equitable Life Assurance Society of the United States. <laughs> Next week, we will bring you another colorful story from the files of the Federal Bureau of Investigation, The Friendly Hitchhiker. The incidents used in tonight's Equitable Life Assurance Society's broadcast are adapted from the files of the Federal Bureau of Investigation. However, all names used are fictitious, and any similarity thereof to the names of persons living or dead is accidental. Tonight, the music was composed and conducted by Frederick Steiner. The author was Frank Perez, and your narrator was Dean Carlton. 
This is your FBI, is a Jerry Devine production. This is Milton Cross speaking for the Equitable Life Assurance Society of the United States and the Equitable Society's representative in your community and inviting you to tune in again next week at this same time when the Equitable Life Assurance Society of the United States will bring you another colorful story from the files of the Federal Bureau of Investigation. The Friendly Hitchhiker on This Is Your FBI. This is ABC, the American Broadcasting Company. The Equitable Life Assurance Society presents This is your FBI. This is your FBI, an official broadcast from the files of the Federal Bureau of Investigation, presented as a public service by the Equitable Life Assurance Society of the United States, and the Equitable Society's representative in your community. Are you one of the 50 million Americans covered by Social Security? If so, have you any clear idea of your rights and benefits under Social Security? Well, there may be a pleasant surprise in store for you. For in a few minutes, you will learn from our sponsor, the Equitable Life Assurance Society of the United States, how easy it is to build social security into full security. Tonight's FBI file, The Friendly Hitchhiker. One of the outstanding characteristics of the average American is a natural friendliness toward the stranger. Now, this is an admirable trait, and certainly, in general, it is one to be preserved and encouraged. But unfortunately, there are a great many persons at large who make criminal capital of friendliness. And there are many occasions, such as in tonight's case from the files of your FBI, when it is wise to avoid the stranger altogether. Already the prairie growth was beginning to take on the first tints of a Texas panhandle sunset. And as the young man in the sailor suit trudging along the highway with his battered suitcase, it looked as if night would catch him still some 50 miles from his goal. Amarillo. Unless this car that's coming down the highway stops. All right, son, will you stop? Going east, sailor? Yes, sir. Then get aboard, son. Gee, thanks. I was afraid you were going to plow right on by. I didn't notice your uniform until I was right on you. Oh, some people stop for it, some don't. I guess you can't blame anybody for not wanting to take a chance on a hitchhiker. How far are you coming from, sailor? Oh, I just got my discharge in California the other day. In the hospital out there. 
I guess that means you earned one of those campaign ribbons the hard way. Huh. Wasn't as hard for me as it was for some of the other fellas, though. Where are you bound? Amarillo. Well, so am I. No kidding. Is that home? Yes, sir. My uncle has a place outside of town. He's a retired rancher. I see. Well, now that you're out of the Navy, what are you going to do? Well, I got to go to work. Say, uh, you haven't got a job for me, have you? <laughs> I'm afraid a young fellow with your experiences wouldn't find my kind of business very exciting. Well, what kind of business are you in, sir? I pick up stocks of jewelry that small retail stores get stuck with and sell it at auction at my shop in Los Angeles. Oh, oh I see. I'm picking up some stuff in Amarillo this evening. Uh-huh. Oh, by the way, uh, what's a good hotel in Amarillo? Well, uh, two or three good ones. Oh, but look, mister, you don't have to spend your money on a hotel. What do you mean? Well, you've been nice to me, giving me a lift. I know my uncle would be more than glad to have you. Why don't you stay with us till you get ready to go back? Well, no, I, I wouldn't want to impose. Oh, you don't impose on people in Texas by staying with them, mister. You'll make them very happy. <laughs> and, and besides, you'll get some real old cow hand cooking and lots of fresh air that's swell for sleeping. How about it? Soul. Swell. Some 300 miles back west and shortly before the hitchhiker was picked up, Special Agents Allen and Burnett of the FBI's Los Angeles office, engaged in a manhunt, landed at the Albuquerque airport in response to a police report. After a brief conference at police headquarters, they procured a car and drove at once to a tourist camp west of the city for a talk with the owner. Well, gentlemen, that picture sure looks like the young fellow that stopped here last night, all right. Only he was wearing a sailor suit with a lot of ribbon. What kind of a car was he driving, sir? Uh, it was a black Chevy sedan, California license. Uh, do you remember the license number? Um, no, sir. About how old was it? Well, I'd say it was the same as my brother's got, a 42. Oh, that checks, Bernard. Uh -huh. What name did he register under? Um, Jack Smith. Uh, here it is on the register right over here. There it is. Jack Smith. Mm -hmm. Burnett, where's that yeah. sample of Jack Newton's handwriting? Uh, here you are. Thanks. Mm -hmm. I'd say it was the same writing, Alan. Yes. May we borrow this page for a few days, sir? We'll return it to you. Why, sure you can. Uh, his real name is Newton, huh? Well, the man we're looking for used the name of Jack Newton. He jumped his parole in Los Angeles two days ago. Got a sailor uniform, some ribbons, rented a car, and took out with it. Well... We put out a general police alert as soon as the car was reported missing, but we were just a little too late with it to nail him here. Well, what time did he leave, sir? Well, he didn't pull in till around daylight, slept till about noon, then took off. And that gives him about a six-hour start on us. That's well, right. if he kept on east on this highway, he could have made Amarillo by now. May I use your phone, sir? Why, certainly. Help yourself. Well, what's our move, Alan? We'll notify Amarillo to spread a 300-mile alarm, then head for there ourselves. Right this way, Mr. Ogden. Oh, very well. This will be your room right here, sir. Oh, thank you. I still feel that this is sort of an imposition. Oh. I wish you'd stop saying that, Mr. Ogden. You're going to make my uncle real sore, right, Unc? He certainly will. You were nice enough to give my nephew a ride here. The least I can do is try to repay you for that kind. Well, I certainly appreciate it. Any particular time you want to be getting up in the morning? Yes, pretty early. I have to be in town by 9 o'clock. Well, we'll see that you're up on time, Mr. Ogden. Sure. That's no problem here. <laughs> Thank you. Well, good night, sir. Good night. Good night, Mr. Ogden. Good night. Now, Jack, suppose you give me the tally on all this. Where do we get out of range? Okay. Now, what's the story? Well... I landed out of L.A. The, three days ago. Yeah? This morning, the hot car I was driving got too hot and caught fire, so I had to hoof it. Mm-hmm. Well, I'm a few miles down the road, see, when this Ogden guy gives me a lift. Well, that's fine, but why did you bring him here? I'm not running any tourist camp. Let me give you the whole rundown, will you? 
Well, I pumped the guy on the way in. Found that he's a jewelry auctioneer in Los Angeles. A legitimate businessman? That's right. Now look, son. Running a hideout for you cross-country boys in trouble and taking in legits at the same time is dangerous business. I don't want to get... Let me finish, will you? This guy's going into Amarillo in the morning to pick up a load of jewelry. Then he's coming back here again. Get it? Oh. If we can't figure out some way to split that jewelry between us, we ought to give up. Now, do you see why I brought him here? Yeah, yeah. Does it uh, still bother you? Bother me? <laughs> Son, how can you say such a thing? Well, I've never entertained a more welcome guest. Knocked off 240 miles of it, Alan. Yeah, that leaves about 50 more to Amarillo. I hope there's good news waiting for us. Well, not much chance this soon. We didn't contact Amarillo from the tourist camp in time for them to head off Newton before he got there. Yeah, but they spread out a 300-mile alarm north, east, and south of there. Yeah, I know. Slow down for a minute. Huh? What for? There's a car off the road there, up ahead. Oh, yeah. And no taillight, either. Oh. Maybe we better have a look. You don't think we're going to find Newton parked out here? Well, not look. That car's been on fire. Yeah. Come on, let's take a look at it. All right. Looks pretty well burned out, too. Yeah. Ted, you got your flash? Yeah, right here. Hey, look at that license. That's Newton's car, all right. And there's no one in it. Will make Newton a little harder to find. Well, he's still probably wearing the sailor suit, and certainly he still has the same face, hair, eyes, and build. And if he's on foot now, that could slow him down a lot. I hope so. He might even be somewhere around Amarillo right now. Well, let's take a quick look around here and then drive in there and find out. Digging that hole huh? for us. Huh? Looking for oil? Son, I told you to stay in the house and keep a lookout for Ogden. It's not back from town yet. What's with the digging? Well, to tell you the truth, this is something special for him. What do you mean? Well, we can't take his jewelry and let him go, can we? What? Well, that'd be all right for you, because you're pulling out, but I'm not going anywhere. I'm staked out right here, and he could have the law on me in no time. Yeah, but if you bump him Look, off... Who'd ever think he was buried in the hole down back old man Fillmore's corral? I'm a respectable citizen in these parts, son. Yeah, sure, but just the same. Hold on. Oh, listen. There's Ogden now. Just pulled into the drive. Come on. Let's get back to the house. That you, Mr. Ogden? Uh, yes. Uh, Jack and I is down to look after the stock a little. Oh? Have to treat him like babies, you know. <laughs> yes, I'll bet you do. And come on up to the house. Very well. Get your business in town, taken care of all right? Yes, all done. You mean you got that suitcase full of jewels? <laughs> well, not quite full. Kind of dangerous traveling with them, I'd think. But I reckon you packed a gun with you. Yes, but thank goodness I've never had to use it yet. Now, go in, sir, go in. Thank you. Go ahead, Jack. Thanks. Well, I can you might as well set your jewels down right here in the kitchen, Mr. Ogden. I beg your pardon? Look, it's me that ought to be begging your pardon instead of you begging mine. But I guess we won't make any ceremony about it. I'm sorry, I don't understand. Well, now, maybe this will be more convincing. All right, son. Take his gun off him and any identifying papers that might be in his pocket. Yeah, sure. I'll take a look in this suitcase. Hey, must be a fortune in jewels in here. No kidding. Find his gun? Yeah, yeah, I got it. Let's look at all this stuff. Unc. Huh? You slugged Ogden with that blackjack. Yeah? If the cops found Ogden's gun in his hand, they might figure he shot you just before he passed out, right? I suppose they would if that was the case, but... What do you mean, sir? I mean, this way I get all the jewels in Ogden's car, too. No, wait a minute. You can't do it. <laughs> 
You know what? Maybe there but would have been room for both of you in that hole. <laughs> We will return in just a moment to tonight's case, which shows how your FBI helps provide national security. Now, let's listen in on a conversation about social security between a high-salaried executive and his friend, the Equitable Society representative. Well, frankly, Milton, I've never given much thought to social security. I suppose it's a good thing for the man who earns $40, $50 a week, but when you get a lot more than that, it's pretty much small potatoes, isn't it? I don't know, Paul. Is $8,000 small potatoes to you? Of course not. But what's $8,000 got to do with Social Security? Look, Paul, when you get to be 65, it will cost you $8,000 at today's rates to buy an annuity that would give you the same retirement income you'll get under Social Security. And $8,000 is a lot of money. Well, I'll say it is. When you put it that way, Milton, Social Security is an asset to any man, whether he makes $50 a week or $500. Yes, many Americans don't realize what a wonderful asset they have in Social Security. They have never discovered how easy it is to build Social Security into full security through life insurance. Well, that's a job that we representatives of the Equitable Society are always glad to undertake. For instance, if you already own some life insurance, your Equitable Society representative may be able to show you how only a few dollars extra per month will give your family complete protection and assure you a comfortable retirement income through the Equitable Extended Income Plan. Remember, your Social Security benefits vary according to your age, salary, and family situation. So why not get the facts and find out exactly what you are entitled to under Social Security? The government has prepared a special card that will help you secure this information. To obtain one of these cards, get in touch with your Equitable Society representative or send your name and address on a postcard to the Equitable Society care of this station. That's E-Q-U-I-T-A-B-L-E, -E, the Equitable Life Assurance Society of the United States. <laughs> And now, back to the FBI file, The Friendly Hitchhiker. There are hundreds of honest persons in and out of uniform hitchhiking along the highways of America today. But the safest policy for any motorist is this. No matter when or where you see a hitchhiker's thumb, keep right on going. It may cost you no more than time to stop, but in thousands of cases, it has cost a lot more. Special Agents Allen and Burnett of the FBI had arrived at the Amarillo Police Headquarters when a telephone call came in from the Fillmore place just out of town. Since the message involved the man they were trailing, Allen and Burnett were given complete charge, and a few minutes later... All right, Mr. Ogden, let's have the rest of the story, sir. Well, when, when I came to, I, I was lying on the floor there, not more than three feet from his body, and I, I had the pistol in my hand. This is your pistol, Mr. Ogden? Yes, but... I, but I swear I didn't shoot him. Well, if you were being threatened with a blackjack, you would have been justified in defending yourself. But there wasn't time. It, it all happened so quickly. Mr. Ogden, just how were you lying on the floor when you came to, sir? Well, I was... Will you show us, if you don't mind, sir? Well, of course I don't. Thank you. I was, uh, I was just about like this. Half on your right side like that? Yes. And when you came to, sir, where was the pistol? I was holding it in this... In my... Why, well, that proves I couldn't have shot him. The pistol was in my left hand. Where is your shoulder holster placed? Well, oh, here, you, you can see for yourself, right here, under my left arm. I'm right-handed. If I had shot Fillmore, the gun would have been in my right hand. Well, Mr. Ogden, we're not trying to pin a murder on you, sir. In your case, it wouldn't have been murder anyway. 
We're merely trying to establish evidence that will help fasten the guilt on the real murderer. It's pretty obvious what actually happened. Yes, you see, after Fillmore struck you down, Jack Newton took your gun, shot Fillmore, put the gun in your hand, took all the jewels for himself, and escaped in your car. But in his hurry, he made the mistake of putting the gun in your left hand. I'm awfully glad he did. Uh, Burnett, will you get on the phone and start telling the police about the body yet? Yeah, right. Before you're through, I'll have Mr. Ogden's full description of his car. Okay. Operator. Operator, get in the Amarillo of police headquarters. And Burnett, have the police broadcast a description of Newton and the car, then set up roadblocks as quick as possible in every direction. Hello, headquarters? Now, uh, Mr. Ogden, yeah. you'll give me a full description of your car. <laughs> No, just black. Okay. There you are. Thanks. You like something with that? Uh-uh. You jelly don't? I don't want nothing. Okay. Which way you traveling? Why? Making conversation. Heading east. Oh. Well, the reason I asked was if you're going to be on the road tonight, you'd better look out. For what? For what I heard on the radio. What are you talking about? It was an FBI broadcast. What? They said everybody should be on the lookout for this man that just murdered somebody in Amarillo. They say what he looked like? Uh-huh. They said he was about 25 years old and had brown hair and kind of greenish eyes and might be wearing a suit. What do I owe you? Well, well you only had coffee. Yeah. Well, well, wait a minute. You get some change. Keep it. <sighs> Probably scared him. Tell him about that. Wait a minute. Brown hair, green eyes, sailor. Oh. Hey, operator, operator. Well, Burnett, the police have got roadblocks set up a radius of 300 miles around that road. Good. How's your map coming? Well, I've got just about every roadside gas station, lunch stand, and tourist camp in the entire area staked out with these pins. Oh, good work. Uh, are they going to repeat the broadcast? Every half hour till we make a strike. And then all we've got to do is sit right here at the phone they've assigned us and wait. Oh, let's see. Well, it's been a half hour now since the third broadcast. We ought to be hearing it. I got my fingers crossed, Alan. Hello? Yes. Yes, we'll put her on, please. Well, who is it? Operator, Las Vegas, New Mexico. New Mexico? Newton must be doubling back towards California. Hello? Hello? Yes? Oh, miss? Miss, please talk a little louder and try not to be so excited. All right, boys. He's all filled and ready to go. So get your trucker rolling out of here for that long haul now. Okay. <laughs> so long, Clem. <laughs> so long. <laughs> Hello. Howdy. I uh, had a little trouble with my car. Broke down about two miles back. I'm afraid I can't be much help to you. Oh, I, I didn't mean for you to go pull her in. Thought you might rent me a car to get to the next town. Oh, there's uh, no car here till my brother-in-law comes to relieve me in the morning. Oh. Uh, but I'll tell you what I'll do, son. Oh, what's that? If you'll just wait right here, I'll go inside and phone for somebody to, to come out and get you. You just wait right out here. Wait a minute, mister. Well? You're not going to phone for anybody to help me? You're going to phone for somebody to come get me, just like you said. What? You heard that radio broadcast about me, didn't you? I don't know what you're, you're lying, about. but you're not going to trap me. Well, wait, come back here. Hello there, right this way, 
fellas. We're the special agents of the FBI. Hey, you fellas didn't come all the way from Ar- Amarillo since I phoned. No, we were already on the trail and called in and got your report. Well, he ain't missed him more than an hour, and he's on foot besides. Good. Uh, which way did he go? Well, he lit out running hard as he could down the road going west. Well, he can't afford to keep to the road long. No, he'd get lost out there on that desert. A uh, desperate man will take any kind of chance. Of course, he might stumble onto them caves off over there. Well, where's this, sir? Oh, about three miles across the flats where the hills begin. Burnett, let's see if we can pick up where he turned off into the desert. All right. If you do, you had not to have no trouble tracking him across that red sand. That's what I figure. Come on, Burnett. Wait a minute, Burnett. What's the matter? We're on the trail. There's a fork in the trail. One goes straight ahead into the tunnel, and the other turns off sharply to the left. How much listen and see if we can pick up the sound? Okay. Well, he probably stopped so we couldn't hear him. Then we'll just have to try one of these tunnels. If we take the wrong one, he'll double back and get out. We can't miss hearing him do it. Yeah, that's right. Well, let's take this one to the left first. Uh-huh. I hear him, Ellen. We get the right one. Come on! Oh. Wait a minute. <laughs> Jack Newton was returned to the state of Texas to stand trial for the murder of Robert Fillmore. He was found guilty and sentenced to life imprisonment. As mentioned earlier, the average American's natural friendliness is an admirable trait and one to be preserved and encouraged. The greatness of our nation is based on friendship and without it, our rendezvous with destiny would be meaningless. But your FBI asks you to exercise caution, particularly when you feel inclined to give a lift to a hitchhiker. The files of your FBI reveal case after case proving that the safest policy with hitchhikers is to keep right on driving. In just a moment, we'll tell you about next week's colorful story from the files of your FBI. And now, once again, friends, let me remind you that no matter how much you earn, you have a valuable asset in Social Security, and your Equitable Society representative will gladly show you how easy it is to build your Social Security into full security. He will explain to you how Social Security and life insurance can work together for your complete protection and will help you determine exactly where you stand under Social Security. No obligation, of course. Phone him tomorrow. Your Equitable Society representative is listed in your local phone book under the name the Equitable Life Assurance Society of the United States. Next week, we will bring you another colorful story from the files of the Federal Bureau of Investigation, the Careless Kidnappers. The 
incidents used in tonight's Equitable Life Assurance Society's broadcast are adapted from the files of the Federal Bureau of Investigation. However, all names used are fictitious, and any similarity thereof to the names of persons living or dead is accidental. Tonight, the music was composed and conducted by Frederick Steiner. The author was Frank Ferries, and your narrator was Dean Carlton. This is your FBI, is a Jerry Devine production. And now this is Milton Cross speaking for the Equitable Life Assurance Society of the United States and the Equitable Society's representative in your community and inviting you to tune in again next week at this same time when the Equitable Life Assurance Society of the United States will bring you another colorful story from the files of the Federal Bureau of Investigation. The Careless Kidnappers on This Is Your FBI. This is ABC, the American Broadcasting Company. The Equitable Life Assurance Society presents This is Your FBI. <laughs> This is your FBI, an official broadcast from the files of the Federal Bureau of Investigation, presented as a public service by the Equitable Life Assurance Society of the United States and the Equitable Society's representative in your community. Are you one of the 50 million Americans covered by Social Security? If so, have you any clear idea of your rights and benefits under Social Security? Well, there may be a pleasant surprise in store for you. For in a few minutes, you will learn from our sponsor, the Equitable Life Assurance Society of the United States, how easy it is to build Social Security into full security. <laughs> Tonight's FBI file, The Careless Kidnappers. The business of crime in America is experiencing the greatest boom in the history of the nation. It has no problem of manpower, for today, one out of every 23 persons in America has an arrest record. And it has no problem of raw materials, for its raw materials are potential victims and money. And there's a population of 140 million people on hand who are making more money than ever before. Consequently, the wheels of every branch of crime including that dealt with in tonight's case from the files of your FBI, are rolling in high gear and turning out an all-time high production volume of a major crime every 17 seconds. In other words, since this program went on the air two and a half minutes ago, eight major crimes have been committed in this country. <laughs> Earl Bedford was, you might say, one of the most even-tempered persons in all the world. Unpleasant all the time. And her disposition is being far from sweetened at the moment by three things. The stifling mid-afternoon heat which is making a furnace of the Chicago apartment, the sight of her husband sprawled on the couch, and the brassy trumpeting of Satch, an unemployed friend who has been sharing the apartment. Pearl paces the floor, then suddenly stops and addresses her husband. Listen, stupid. Yeah, honey? I want you to go across the hall and stuff that bugle down that guy's throat. I will when I get tired of it. He's been blowing his brains out for an hour now. I like it. I don't. Ah, quit beeping, will you? I'll stop beeping when you get out and get us some money. Look, don't start that again. Well, what are you waiting for? Woods are full of suckers with dough, and everybody's getting their share. Everybody but you. I am not interested in nickels and dimes. Oh. Oh, pardon me. When I make a score, it's going to be a big one. Well, you're not going to make it laying around oh, there. shut up, I will won't shut up. Okay, okay. Where are you going? Going in to see Stiet, where it's peaceful. Who's 
Who's there? It's me, Broadway. Come on in. Satch. Yeah? Play some more, will you? Play loud. <laughs> You've been Reuben again? Yeah. What was it this time? Well, for one thing, Pearl don't appreciate your efforts on the trumpet, Satch. No kidding. Well, look, down at the casino, they're paying Hot Lips Hanover 7500 a week for the same kind of efforts. Paying them how much? 7500 pieces of that beautiful green stuff. It's a lot of money every week. It's a lot of money, never mind the time limit. Hey, uh, Satch. Yeah? I guess this Hanover character would hate to stop working right now, wouldn't he? While he can make that kind of dough? Hey, look, if I was making that kind of money, I... What do you mean? You come up with any idea yet how we can make a big touch? Ah. I think I have. Get Pearl in here. What for? I'm going to show her how lucky we are that you've been playing that trumpet. Get a load of those bobby socks out there. Broadway, you're taking a chance parking right in front of the stage door. Quit beefing, will you? Satch. Yeah? You sure you're right about Hot Lips Hanover playing that benefit tonight? Yeah, as soon as he finishes his last show here, he's going right over to the Lakeside Hotel. If he can get through those kids around the door. Here he comes! Here comes Hot Lips Hanover! All right, take the wheel, Satch. Make room in the back seat, Pearl. I'll go get him. Mr. Hanover! Mr. Hanover! Yeah? I'll see if I can get you away all in one piece. I beg your pardon? The car's waiting right over here. The car? Did they tell you they were sending somebody over from the benefit to pick you up? No, no, they didn't tell me. Mr. Hanover, can I have your autograph, please? No, not right now, honey, not right now. That's what we're here for. Come on. Hold on to me. Let's see if we can make it to the car. All right, let's go. All right. Come on. All right, let's through here, will you, kids? Come on. Excuse me, kids. Excuse me. Please. All right, get him, Mr. Hanover. Yeah. Take it away, Satch. I guess you get pretty tired of that kind of stuff. Come, huh, Mr. Hanover. Yeah, I said. Well, I'm sorry. I was in such a hurry to get in the car, I'm afraid I didn't see its very attractive occupant. This is Miss Mason, Mr. Hanover. Hello. Pleased to meet you. Are you playing the benefit tonight, too, Miss Mason? Well, She's, I... She's uh... Uh, part of the show tonight, Mr. Hanover, but not the one at the hotel. Oh, uh, what do you mean? I mean, she has to do with this gun in huh? your side. What is this? You know, Wisconsin is lovely this time of year, Hanover. You might get to enjoy a little of it if everything goes all right. That's up to you. It was shortly before noon the next morning when a little man with a big cigar dashed into the Chicago office of the FBI, where he was ushered into the presence of Agent in Charge Dixon and told his story excitedly. And here's a ransom note, Mr. Dixon. It just arrived in the mail about 20 minutes ago, and I came over with it right away. I'm glad you did. They want $25,000. What are we going to do? Well, our first concern is the safety of the victim. Now, you say Hanover got in a car with someone outside the casino club last night. Yes, but he didn't show up at the hotel for the benefit, and that's the last anyone saw of him. Have any idea who he drove away with? Well, the man on the stage door heard somebody say that he had come over to pick Hanover up. Any description? No. See what kind of car it was? No. He didn't suspect anybody of anything. I'll get the ransom note off to Washington by airmail right away to have it checked for clues. Well, how about the 25000 You're instructed in the note to put an ad in the local paper, letting them know you're willing to meet their terms. You, you mean I'm willing... Aren't you? Yeah, yeah, sure, well, then but... for the uh, sake of Mr. Hanover's uh, safety, and to make it possible for us to go directly to work on the case, our advice is to meet the ransom terms as quickly as you can. Miss... Miss. Yeah? 
That guy inside there playing the trumpet. Does he have to do that? Why, Mr. Hanover, he's a fan of yours. He's got a strange way of showing it. That's how the snatch happened in the first place. What do you mean? He told us how good you were, how much dough you were making. That's what gave us the idea. Oh, now I really feel bad. Look, how much longer are you going to hold me here? That depends. On what? A car just stopped outside. I think I'll, you'll get your answer real soon. Hi, honey. What's the word? Hanover, it looks like you'll be out of the woods by tomorrow night. Oh? What do you mean, Broadway? The ad in the paper says they'll pay off. Here's where you come in, baby. How? You're going to pick up the dough. Are you kidding? Why? This is your party, sweetheart. If you think I'm going to be... Shut the... up and listen. Satch keeps Hanover here. You and I drive into Chicago tomorrow morning. At 11 o'clock, a woman in a blue dress wearing a gardenia will be standing at the perfume counter in Gordon's department store. I don't get it. You'll be standing next to her. When she leaves, she'll accidentally drop her bag. You pick it up and start after her. But instead of catching up with her, you go out the other way and bring the bag to me in the car. And there'd be 25 grand in the bag? That's right. What's that? Are you deaf? Just follow the sound of those musical notes. Oh. Satch. Yeah? Satch, you sure you can trust that brother of yours in Des Moines? Sure, he's 100%. Been running a hideout for three years. Never lost a customer. Okay, then go back inside and write him a letter. Tell him company's coming. Okay. I'll mail it in the morning in Chicago. I come in, Mr. Dixon. Come ahead, Webb. How'd you make out? I located a couple of the kids who were standing outside the casino stage door that night. But all they remembered was a big black sedan. I see. Did you hear from Washington? Yes, I just received a teletype. The ransom note was written on cheap stationery that you can get at any store for a nickel. Mm-hmm. The handwriting doesn't check with any on file, and there were no fingerprints. Uh, uh, what next? The ransom money is being picked up in the department store at 11 o'clock. Yes. At least we'll have a picture of whoever comes for the money. Well, uh, how's that? I planted Jackson with a camera on a stepladder a couple of counters away, as though he's making pictures for display ads. And he'll get a shot of whoever picks up the bag. Right. And as soon as Hanover is safe, the hunt begins. <laughs> about letting that thing cool off for a while? Don't stop me now. I just got it warmed up. All right, cut it out, Satch. Oh, hiya, Broadway. You got the money? Yep. Come on, we got to be moving. Okay, but look what I got. Mr. Hotlips gave me his own trumpet. Hey, that was real generous of you, Hanover. Generous? Well, what else could I do? Satch, you didn't threaten I this. never threatened nothing. I just asked the man to give me his horn for a sort of part and gift, and he said no, so I started doing a little whittling with my knife. Yeah, yeah, I get it. Hanover, I'll have to blindfold you again. I'm used to it by now. Okay, here you go. Hey, that's got it. That too tight? No, let's get started. Come on, Seth. Okay. Broadway. Yeah? Tell me about the dough. What about it? You get the whole 25000 Sure. Hey, that ain't fair. 25,000 divided by three. That's a nice hunk for me. Over eight G's. Uh huh. Where's Pearl? Over there in the car. Is she gonna beef? About what? About cutting me in for a third. Ah, she ain't gonna beef about nothing. It don't sound like Pearl. Get behind the wheel, Satch. You drive. Okay. Do we head right in for. Hey. What's the matter? Look at Pearl. Well, <laughs> no wonder she can't beef. He's dead.
We will return in just a moment to tonight's case, which shows how your FBI helps provide national security. Now, let's listen in on a conversation about social security between a man named Fred Cameron and his friend, the Equitable Society representative. Listen, Milton, you've been holding out on me. Last night, that brother-in-law of mine was bragging how he was going to retire on a nice, comfortable income when he got to be 65. That's right, Fred, he is. Yes, and he said you worked the whole thing out for him. You showed him how to make Social Security and life insurance dovetail. He said it was amazing how little it costs to build Social Security into full security. That's what we Equitable Society representatives are always saying. Well, why not say it to me? You're supposed to be my friend, too. All right, Fred. With your two children, ages five and three, your Social Security is equivalent to about $13,210 worth of life insurance. And that makes a mighty good foundation on which to build full security. I'll say it does. Let's hear some more. Yes, Fred, most Americans are amazed when they find out what a valuable asset they have in Social Security. When they discover how easy it is to build Social Security into full security through life insurance. For instance, if you already own some life insurance, your Equitable Society representative may be able to show you how only a few dollars extra per month will give your family complete protection and assure you a comfortable retirement income through the Equitable Extended Income Plan. Remember, your Social Security benefits vary according to your age, salary, and family situation. So why not get the facts? Find out exactly what you are entitled to under Social Security. The government has prepared a special card that will help you secure this information. To obtain one of these cards, Get in touch with your Equitable Society representative or send your name and address on a postcard to the Equitable Society care of this station. That's E-Q-U-I-T-A-B-L-E, -E, the Equitable Life Assurance Society of the United States. And now, back to the FBI file, The Careless Kidnappers. Through its policy of waiting until the victim is released, your FBI severely handicaps itself in the task of apprehending the kidnappers. But the safety of the victim comes first, and strict adherence to its rule of waiting has meant, in scores of cases, the difference between life and death for the victim. As for the kidnapper, no matter how much of a start this rule of waiting gives him, the advantage is inevitably lost. For like any other criminal, he always leaves one or more traces of his crime, which in turn lead always to his capture. Released by his kidnappers shortly after dark in a suburb of Chicago, the victim Hanover identified himself to a passing police patrol and was driven swiftly to the city to FBI headquarters where he gave an account of events up to the time of his release. I was still blindfolded when they put me out, so I was unable to get a good description of the car. They've probably gotten rid of it by now, anyway. But the body of that woman was still in the car. They've probably gotten rid of that, too, Mr. Hanover. Mr. Hanover, we have a picture here of the woman who picked up the ransom money. One of our agents snapped it in the department store. Here it is. Uh-huh, that's her, all right. They call it Pearl. We haven't been able to identify it yet with anybody in our files or at police headquarters. I see. Webb. Yes? Get a teletype off to Washington right away on those nicknames. Uh, Broadway and Satch? Yeah, that's right. Washington may be able to find something on them in the nickname file. Right. Mr. Hanover, you said we might be able to find the cabin where they held you. Yeah. They blindfolded me, of course, before we got out of Chicago that night. Uh-huh. But after a while, the blindfold slipped a bit. And I remember seeing that we went north after passing through Kenosha. Yeah. Then they discovered the blindfold had slipped and fixed it back. Oh? But about 15 minutes later, we passed over a wooden bridge. I could hear the planking rattle. Uh-huh. I got a sudden idea. As soon as we were off the bridge, I snapped on the second hand on my wristwatch here. It's a stopwatch model, you see. Oh, yes. We turned right. And when we stopped at the cabin, I stopped the watch. Good. 
But when they took the blindfold off, I noticed that we had traveled four minutes and 28 seconds from the bridge. Good for you. I wish all kidnapped victims would be that alert. Now, how fast was the car traveling, would you say? Well, Broadway kept warning Satch to hold the speed to 35 miles an hour because of the highway police. Uh Uh-huh. Hanover, this may be the lead that helps crack the case, if we can find that cabin. This is the cabin, all right, Mr. Dixon. Flash on your light, Webb. Right. Let's look around. Somebody's bound to have left a fingerprint or two somewhere around here. Uh, Would they likely be on a drinking glass? Definitely. Why? Well, there's the glass Broadway used to drink whiskey out of last night. This one here? Yeah. Hold that light closer. Okay. Look at them. Yes, three clear prints. We'll get those all right. Uh, Webb, put your hand inside the glass and hold it steady, will you? Right. I'll just get this powder and this tape out. Now, how do you take the prints? Well, we'll cover them with dusting powder. Take a strip of this lifting tape. Stick it on over the dusted prints. And peel the tape off. And... Oh, the impression of the prints is on the tape. Yes. Mr. Dixon. Yes? This uh, writing tablet here on the table... Look at the paper. Yes. It looks like the same kind the ransom note was written on. And the inside of the cover is a blotter, too. Look, it's been used. Yeah, the one called Satch wrote a letter on the tablet last night. Broadway was going to mail it in Chicago this morning. Now, yeah, give me that mirror, Webb. Okay. Here you are. Now, see if we can make out those blotted letters. Have to hide out with you... For a... I guess he means for a while. That looks like part of an address down a little farther. Uh Uh-huh. Moines. Des Moines, Iowa. I can't make out the rest. Well, that's enough to start us on our way to Des Moines, though. Right. Well, let's get back to Chicago first and see if we can identify these prints. Broadway. Yeah? You see my trumpet? It's under the couch. What's it doing there? I put it there. Why? I couldn't take any more of that playing. You just don't like music. Not that kind of music. Well, you're unhappy because you got lots of money and you can't get outside to spend it. Yeah, maybe that's it. How long do you think we ought to stay here with my brother? Till the heat's off. How long will that take? Another ten days or so. Oh, that's a long time. Wish I had my Hanover records out here so I'd have something to play against. That's all we need. Well, wait a minute. Hmm? I just thought of something. What? The radio. They should be playing them on one of the stations out here. <laughs> hey, give me my trumpet. Teletype just in from Washington, Mr. Dixon. Thanks. Well, here's the works, Webb. The prints on the glass belong to Joseph Bedford, extortionist, swindler. Yes. And the nickname report says Bedford's nickname is Broadway. Good. As for the nickname Satch, the only one on record belongs to a man named Johnson who works with Broadway Joe Bedford. Mm Mm-hmm. Well, what's our next move? First, let's take a look around in Bedford's Chicago apartment. Here's his last known address. Maybe Satch lived there, too. Right. And then we'll head for Des Moines. What luck, Webb? Well, I've combed all the record stores here in Des Moines, Dixon, and nobody answering Satch's description has bought any Hanover recording. I don't understand that. There must have been at least a hundred Hanover records in his Chicago room. It's a cinch. They have gone under here somewhere. If only the rest of that address had come off on the blotter. Well, anyway, the photos of Broadway and Satch arrived here by air a little while ago. We won't have any trouble identifying them when we do find... Wait a minute. Got an idea? Hanover said wherever we found Satch, we'd find him playing that trumpet. Yes, but... And he's got to have a recording to play against. And for Satch, it's got to be a Hanover recording. He hasn't bought any here. Maybe he wouldn't have to buy any. What? 
It's a long chance, but it's one worth trying, and it just might pay off for us, too. Well, so much for Spoon Light Sinatra, folks. And now all of you bugle bugs get set for some blazing blasts from a tar trumpet. Because here's a request recording by Hot Lips Hanover. That's my boy, Broadway. Drop the needle and give us a downbeat, son. Class, could I throw a little bribe money at you? Satch, listen to me, will you? Satch! Did you say something, Broadway? I'll give you 50 bucks for that trumpet. Hey, look, this horn is a hot lip Hanover original, remember? Okay, hijacker, I'll give you 50 bucks to stop playing just for five. Cut off that radio. What's the idea? Sorry to break up the party, boys, but we're special agents of the FBI. What? Uh, You're both under arrest for kidnapping. And there's an extra charge of murder for you, Bedford. A car with your wife's body in it was just found a while ago. Okay. How did you find us? Well, we figured since you didn't bring any Hanover recordings with you, and since you didn't buy any in Des Moines, you might be requesting some to be played in the recording broadcast. Huh? Well, when your call came in, we had it traced here to your brother's house. Give me that horn, Satch. Hey, look out, Broadway. What are you going to do? Broadway! Never mind. You won't be needing it anyway. For their crime of kidnapping, Joseph Bedford and Robin Johnson are serving life terms in a federal penitentiary. Bedford was not tried for the murder of his wife inasmuch as she was her husband's accomplice in crime, and he has received a life sentence anyway for kidnapping. Although fewer kidnappings are committed than any other major crime, their number has increased proportionately with the alarming upsurge of crime in America. According to Mr. J. Edgar Hoover, director of the Federal Bureau of Investigation, crime has increased 13% in the last six months as compared with the corresponding period last year. In a crime survey just compiled by your FBI, we find larceny up 9.8%, aggravated assault, 10%, auto theft, 15.5%, burglary, 17%, negligent manslaughter, 19.2%, murder, 28.5%, and robberies have increased 31.8%. These are startling figures, figures that call for a doubling of effort on the part of all of us, so that this present crime wave shall not become a tidal wave engulfing you, the American people. In just a moment, we'll tell you about next week's colorful story from the files of your FBI. And now, once again, friends, let me remind you that no matter how much you earn, you have a valuable asset in Social Security, and your Equitable Society representative will gladly show you how easy it is to build your Social Security into full security. He will explain to you how Social Security and life insurance can work together for your complete protection and will help you determine exactly where you stand under Social Security. No obligation, of course. Phone him tomorrow. Your Equitable Society representative is listed in your local phone book under the name Equitable, E-Q-U-I-T-A-B-L-E, -E, the Equitable Life Assurance Society of the United States. Next week, we will bring you another colorful story from the files of the Federal Bureau of Investigation, The Return of the Mob. <laughs> The incident used in tonight's Equitable Life Assurance Society's broadcast 
are adapted from the files of the Federal Bureau of Investigation. However, all names used are fictitious, and any similarity thereof to the names of persons living or dead is accidental. Tonight, the music was composed and conducted by Frederick Steiner. The author was Frank Ferries, and your narrator was Dean Carlton. This is your FBI, is a Jerry Devine production. This is Milton Cross speaking for the Equitable Life Assurance Society of the United States and the Equitable Society's representative in your community and inviting you to tune in again next week at this same time when the Equitable Life Assurance Society of the United States will bring you another colorful story from the files of the Federal Bureau of Investigation, The Return of the Mob, on This Is Your FBI. This is ABC, the American Broadcasting Company.